So we are recording the webinar as well, and we will be sending it out to folks uh, after this and be posting it on the website so that uh, people can watch it later if they weren't able to join tonight or if you wanna go back to something that uh, I covered too quickly. So first off, I wanna thank our partners for the Northern Arizona Solar Co-op. We're working with City of Flagstaff and the Sustainability Program the city of Sedona and Coconino County, and really excited to be bringing more solar power to uh, homes and businesses across Northern Arizona. So uh, really excited to, to have this partnership going. Solar United Neighbors works with local governments uh, across the country to work on our co-op programs, as well as nonprofit partners and others to help to spread the word and help people to go solar. So this is, uh, this is exciting for us to be doing it uh, right here where we live. And so I want to just uh, let DC talk a little bit about what City of Flagstaff is doing and how the, um, how the co-op program fits into to their work. Great, thanks, Brent. Uh, again, everyone, my name is Ramon DC Alatore. I'm the Climate and Energy Coordinator at the City of Flagstaff. I am going to take about three to four minutes to talk. Um, I'll be brief because I know that not everyone on this call is a Flagstaff resident, um, but given that you all are a group of uh, people that are at least a little bit interested in solar energy, we thought it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't take a, a couple of minutes to talk about the climate action work that is happening in Flagstaff. Uh, and to invite those of you that are from the city to participate in some of the big uh, decisions that will be happening over the next couple of months. So uh, first, the tiniest bit of history. Uh, in the week, wake of the previous administration's announcement that they intended to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement, Flagstaff, along with hundreds of US states and local governments, started stepping up to take action and take the lead on climate action, uh, making pledges and drafting plans to meet the targets that were set forth in the Paris Agreement. Uh, so here in Flagstaff, the 2018 Climate and Action and Adaptation Plan, which we lovingly call the CAP, uh, was a result of this effort. Uh, and it was passed unanimously by council in 2018. Uh, this plan called for an 80% reduction in community emissions by the year 2050. Uh, however, in the months that followed the adoption of the CAP, it became increasingly clear that even more urgent action would be needed. Uh, and in response, a large coalition of community members brought forth a resolution asking our city council to adopt a climate emergency declaration and to advance the goals of the CAP. So now, rather than aiming for 80% reduction by the year 2050, the re resolution is calling for carbon neutrality by 2030. So a bit of a different goal. Uh, so there was a bit of a uh, uh, COVID delay and then council unanimously adopted the resolution on June 23rd of last year. Since the adoption uh, of the resolution, staff has been developing uh, what is being called the first carbon neutrality plan. Uh, I won't detail all of the community engagement efforts that have already taken place, but I would like to highlight a couple of dates that you all might be interested in, uh, especially if you're the type of resident that likes to keep apprised of the council calendar and submit comments. So we expect to be in front of council next on March 9th. Uh, at that time, we'll be asking council to give us final direction or final guidance in terms of the direction that they would like to uh, see as we complete this first carbon neutrality plan. Uh, essentially, we will be offering them two nearly complete scenarios and asking them which they would like us to finalize. Uh, if you would like council to know your stance on this, please consider doing so before the March 9th meeting. Uh, we then expect to be in front of council again on April 6th. At this meeting, we will bring forward the first carbon neutrality plan that council requested for consideration and adoption. Uh, Brett, if you could go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So if you are interested in learning more and providing input prior to these council dates, the best way to do that would be to participate in the climate emergency open houses that will be taking place throughout the month of February. Uh, there are multiple elements to these open houses. We will be launching an online learning platform in early February with information, resources, and videos from community members discussing different aspects of the climate emergency declaration and the carbon neutrality plan. Residents will be able to access another survey, the results of which will be presented to Council on March 9th. Uh, so that's a good way to make sure that your uh, voice is being heard by Council. Uh, there will also be two live Q&A sessions similar to this uh, taking place on Zoom. One will be on February 11th and one will be on February 17th. And so uh, the best way to stay up to date with all of these happenings and 
and to find the links to the online platform and the survey and the question and answer sessions is to follow us or visit our website. We are on Facebook. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at the Flagstaff Sustainability Program or on Instagram at FLG Sustain. Uh, our website is flagstaffaz.gov slash climate. Uh, and here on this slide, you will also see my email as well as the email of our climate engagement coordinator. So. Uh, Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to talk about all of the work that's happening in Flagstaff. We really do believe that uh, working with partners like Solar United Neighbors, working regionally uh, rather than just uh, within kind of the Flagstaff bubble uh, are all incredible ways to uh, kind of further the efforts uh, associated with the carbon neutrality plan and the original climate action and adaptation plan. So uh, I won't take up any more of your time and happy to hand it back over to Brett. Great, thanks DC. And for folks that live in Flagstaff, highly recommend that you get involved with this effort. Uh, it's really important to have cities that are working on solutions that work for them locally and also reflect the needs of the community. So they need to hear from you and that seems like the, the great way to do that. So wanna, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Solar United Neighbors, who we are, what we do, and then talk about solar, do a solar 101 presentation on technology, our co-op process and uh, economics. So just to start off with Solar United Neighbors, we are a national nonprofit organization. We are working to build a new clean energy system in our country with a focus on rooftop solar. Our mission is to help people go solar, join together and fight for their energy rights. And before I want to get too far into the presentation, want to, you know, address that uh, we think equity is really important in thinking about our energy system and our society and understand that the system we have today really is not equitable and should that should be taken into account to the decisions we make where communities of color, whether uh, it's the black community or Native American communities have uh, really taken on a higher share of the burden uh, when it comes to energy production and extraction in our society and uh, feel disproportionate uh, impacts of the energy system. And so, you know, when we first got started with Solar United Neighbors back in 2007 in uh, Washington, D.C., we had a really sort of diverse economically and racially group of neighbors that came together and a lot of people were going solar to stay in their homes and keep their energy costs low and uh, and address the economic burden that folks were under under the last um, uh, economic crisis. And so that's kind of like where we came from. And we think it's it's really important whether you're thinking about the inequities in home ownership and uh, all these other things. And so we recognize that we're not going to fix all of these problems just with group solar uh, buying campaigns, but with kind of uh, sustained focuses on policy shifts and other uh, opportunities, uh, we think that there are important ways to continue this kind of work. So like I said, we started in 2007 as a, as a neighborhood collective in Washington, DC. Uh, the kid there in the green shirt, uh, his name is Walter and uh, his, him and his friend Diego uh, had seen the film An Inconvenient Truth and they came home and lobbied their mom to go solar and said, you know, we need to fix uh, the, the huge climate problem we just learned about. And we know that solar and clean energy is a big way we can do that. And so um, their mother, who is now our executive director, Anya Schoolman, uh, uh, went on to organize their neighborhood. And, and these kids started knocking on doors and they ended up getting 50 of their neighbors to go solar in a group process. And you know, part of that was they figured out it wasn't that easy to go solar. They were being told different things by different companies. They were trying to figure out what should it cost and, uh, and what's the equipment we need and what's the process. And so they, they tried to learn together as a group and also to create economies of scale through going solar at the same time as a group. So their process took like two years to get a first, the first co-op in Mount Pleasant uh, off the ground, but, but they helped most of those families to go solar. Uh, and then they started taking calls from across the, the, the district and then eventually across the country to bring this co-op model, which we've refined 
uh, over the last dozen plus years into something that can really work. And we've helped lots and lots of people uh, go solar through that process. So uh, since that time, we've run 267 solar co-ops, <clears throat> excuse me, across the country. Uh, we've helped over 5,200 homes go solar through the process. Uh, we've installed 42 megawatts of solar, which was $109 million worth of uh, solar purchases, which is uh, not just the panels, but also the labor and uh, other installation costs that are going back into local economies. Um, our projections are that these solar panels over the 25 years of their life are going to save uh, these folks $186 million in energy savings. And we're going to offset over a billion pounds of carbon uh, in the atmosphere over uh, tw the next 25 years. We just got the Arizona program off the ground last year. And so we have done five solar co-ops before the Northern Arizona solar co-op. And so this is our sixth. We have helped over 100 uh, households go solar, nearly 700 kilowatts installed, and $1.8 million in solar purchases, and almost 30 million pounds of uh, carbon offsets. So we're gonna discuss tonight uh, solar technology, how the solar co-op process works, and then uh, solar economics. And uh, I, I'm seeing some notifications, so folks uh, keep putting your questions in the, in the chat or the Q and A as we go. <clears throat> so solar technology. So this is how, when you go solar, this is a basic setup for how it's going to work. So we're talking about solar photovoltaic panels or PV. And this is the technology that turns sunlight into electricity that can be used in your home. And so it starts with the panels on your roof and then the energy has to go through what's called an inverter to take the energy from direct current to alternating current so that your home can use the energy. From there, it connects to your electrical panel and then anytime the sun is shining and your panels are uh, producing power and you're using power in your home, it's drawing directly from your solar panels for that power. If you have any extra power that you're not using, if you're not home during the day, it goes back through your utility meter and then back onto the grid where it gets used by your neighbors or anyone that's using electricity nearby. And then your utility credits you for the extra power that you're sending back. And so you're both offsetting power that you need from the utility by using it directly. And then you're getting some credits back for any extra power that's being sent to the grid when you don't need it. So uh, some important technology just to level, or terminology, excuse me, to level set uh, about technology. So first is we're gonna use the terms kilowatts and kilowatt hours. And so to make sure everyone knows what those things mean, um, kilowatts uh, is how you measure the size of the solar system. So a, uh, a solar array that's made, uh, and then a kilowatt is a thousand watts. And so a system that is uh, made up of, uh, of 3,000 watt, uh, watts of panels is a three kilowatt system, or 7,000 watts of panels is a seven kilowatt system. So we're going to talk kind of in those terms going forward. And then electricity production is measured in kilowatt hours. So how much energy you're buying from the utility or how much power is being produced by the panels that you have installed. So those are two different, uh, two different things to know. And then, you know, most homeowners are going to install between two and 12 kilowatts. We know from APS data that the average size in APS territory is around 10 kilowatts and the uh, the average size that we've done through our co-ops, which include different utility territories in Arizona is around seven kilowatts. So just to give you a sense of size there. Excuse me, I had to take a drink. So 
uh, we're going to talk through some of the components. So panels obviously are the, the main component of a solar array. This is what you're going to uh, attach to your, your roof or put near your home to create electricity. The panels are also called modules. And the kind of magic section of the panel is the solar cell, which is made of silicon. And that's uh, what is transferring light into electricity. And the rest of the panel is, is uh, built to really protect that solar cell. Um, the panels are warranted uh, to last for at least 25 years uh, from the manufacturer. And they're also guaranteed to produce power for 25 years uh, at a level that's just slightly below what they would produce in year one, they're guaranteed to produce uh, usually between 80 and 90% of that year one production in year 25. And then when you string all the panels together, they're known as a solar array. <clears throat> Next, you have the inverter. So this is what transfers the energy from direct current to alternating current so that your home can use the power. And you're either going to be offered a string inverter option uh, from the solar installer or a micro inverter option. And basically the difference is the string inverter is a central box that strings all of your uh, panels together uh, all in one kind of unit. And then the micro inverter is, uh, is inverting the uh, energy at the panel level. So you have a little bit more uh, detailed um, data that you can get from a microinverter setup to know exactly which panel is, is kind of outproducing other panels and you can identify some issues that way. Um, but you know, I think I've had some longevity issues as well. So we're essentially agnostic on the different types of in inverters and some installers only install one kind over another, uh, but you'll be given those options from the company when uh, they talk to you. And then the, from there, the system gets connected uh, in a simple connection to your electrical panel. And that's where it uh, feeds energy into your home for, for use. Most homes do not require an electrical upgrade to go solar, but some will. And so we get pricing for that uh, front through the bidding process from uh, the installation companies, it's usually uh, a couple thousand bucks. So racking is how the panels themselves get attached to your roof. And there's a different racking solution for pretty much almost any kind of roof. So if you have a flat roof, if you have an asphalt shingle roof, uh, you, can, you can make solar work. Uh, the, the typical way that it gets installed is uh, using this beam method where uh, the panels themselves are attached to these metal beams and then the beams are screwed into the house and they are flashed underneath the shingles so that when we have events like today where there's uh, snow or rain, uh, there's no leakage that comes in to, uh, to your roof uh, by the, the penetration. Uh, Every solar company should offer you a labor warranty when you go solar uh, that will cover the penetrations on your roof. And those warranties are usually two to 10 years depending. And that's also something that we ask through our bidding process. And, uh, and, and that will cover in case you know, there's a potential leak, uh, they will come back and fix it under the, under the warranty. So the different types of, uh, of racking, uh, the, the basic version here is, is the flashing underneath the asphalt shingle. Um, there's a similar type that's used uh, uh, on a Spanish tile roof. They will do a similar kind of flashing underneath. Uh, there's ballasting that you can essentially just weigh the panels down on a flat roof. Uh, beams are used typically on roofs that have uh, parapet walls. If you have a metal seam roof, you can just clamp the solar panels on to the seam. And then a pitch pocket is something that's used on a flat roof to uh, basically pitch the panel up so that you can be uh, soaking in as much sunlight as, as possible and maximizing your uh, production. Uh, if you have more space or live in a more rural uh, part of Northern Arizona, you may consider getting a ground mounted system. Uh, you can get a larger system this way. 
and uh, you can make sure that it's pointed in the right direction and it's not shaded or anything like that. Uh, ground mounts are typically more expensive because they uh, require you know, additional infrastructure to put the panels on and then trenching to, uh, to put the kind of wires and things into the ground. Uh, so, you know, it's something to consider. We, we have a bunch of ground mounted projects going on in Portal, Arizona right now, which is a, a rural area where, we, where we're doing a co-op. So uh, what's a good roof for solar? One of the things we do when folks sign up for the co-op is we'll give you a, a satellite assessment of your home and, uh, this, and, and just give you an upfront uh, uh, assessment on, hey, there's a big tree in the way that might be creating a lot of shade where you wanna put your solar, you know, so you may wanna consider trimming that tree or, you know, is this a seasonal thing? Like it's, it's something that uh, the solar installers will, will definitely look at and something that we do to take off their plate and provide uh, some additional value for the group. But in general, you want the roof to face south is the best for power production. Uh, you're gonna get more direct sunlight that way. Uh, west is the next best facing uh, roof side because west, uh, you're still gonna get a lot of daylight and it's gonna be generating energy into the late afternoon when you're really gonna be using power and offsetting utility uh, when uh, power is expensive from the utility. And then you wanna make sure you just have enough space to mount the panels on. So, you know, you, you can mount panels on multiple roof uh, areas, but it's most efficient to do it on just one or maybe two sections of the roof. And so you need to just make sure you have enough unobstructed space to put the panels. And then I'm gonna talk about two additional components to our process here now. The first is batteries, and then I'll talk a little bit about electric vehicles and electric vehicle chargers. Um, but first, you know, so what happens when the power goes down? Uh, and a lot of people actually lost power today in, in the Phoenix area. I don't know if folks lost power up north, but uh, the, even if you have solar, your power shuts off at your home during a power shutoff. And that is a, a grid safety uh, uh, policy essentially that the inverter will shut off <clears throat> uh, power from the system so that there's not extra electricity in the lines as grid workers are working to solve the problem. And if you do want power during an outage, you need to have uh, a battery backup system that's connected to your solar array. So the value of installing a battery is something that more and more people are uh, kind of considering and looking at. And so these are a couple of things that I would think about if you're, if you're thinking about doing solar plus battery storage. So it's still used mainly for backup power. So if you're in an area that has frequent utility outages uh, and you wanna have the, the confidence that you're gonna always have power, having a, back, a battery backup system uh, could make sense for you because it just brings a lot of value to knowing you're gonna have that ability to, to have backup energy in an outage. Um, in some cases, folks are, are programming batteries more uh, to offset peak energy use. So uh, APS's peak hours go from 3 to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. And so the sun goes down in the winter at 5.30, goes down in the summer around 7. And so in that, you know, 5.30 to 8 or 6 to 8 window, and your solar is falling off in production, you could start drawing from a battery to uh, not pay those most expensive uh, times from the utility. Um, it's not gonna completely you know, pay for itself uh, at this point, but battery costs are starting to fall and more incentives are being uh, uh, put forward through taxes and through utility incentives uh, to install batteries. So uh, over time is something to keep an eye on. And then in the future, this is not possible uh, today, but in the future, people are looking at, can we aggregate distributed battery storage in homes that are powered by rooftop solar to then be used by grid operators or utility companies 
at critical times of need during the year. So think about the hottest days of the year when the grid is really stressed out and they're telling us to you know, use less power, they, can, they could maybe draw from a small percentage of thousands of home batteries to uh, make up for power that they really need at that time. And then customers would get credited on their bill for any power that they sold back to the utility uh, to help out in that situation. So we're starting to talk about the rules of the road for, um, some something like that, but it, that it, that situation is also known as something like a virtual power plant. So, if you've heard that phrase, that's kind of where that comes from. If you want to know more about batteries, uh, we have a uh, battery storage guide and other resources like this on our website. So you can go uh, to that link. And then. Uh, folks may already be driving electric cars or you're thinking my next car is going to be electric. And so you may want to consider also getting a, uh, a level two electric vehicle charger as you go solar. Uh, and that's something that a lot of solar installers, because they are electricians, can help you with. And so something to think about. There's different kinds of electric vehicle chargers. And we could honestly do an entire webinar on electric vehicles. So I'm not gonna give this the, the time that it deserves and happy to answer more questions. But essentially when you buy an EV or lease one, you get a level one charger and that's just plugs into a regular 120 volt outlet. And it's really slow to charge the car. It takes, it's like five miles of charge per hour. You need to really charge it for a long time to get it up to full charge. But if you install a level two charger, you can charge like 20 miles an hour and it'll charge a lot faster uh, for what you need to do. But you need a 240 volt outlet like uh, what your electric dryer plugs into in order to operate it. So that is an additional cost. And then the cost of the charger itself can run $1,000 to $2,000. But we get pricing on uh, 240 volt outlet chargers as well as level two chargers through the co-op. So that's, you know, it's something that you could think about as, uh, as an add-on when you're going solar. And that's just one uh, example of what uh, one of these chargers looks like. You can get, you know, 10 to 30 miles of a charge depending on the vehicle and all of those things. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the solar co-op process. And so, you know, why go solar through the co-op? We're able through economies of scale to get competitive group pricing. We already have 45 members of the Northern Arizona Solar Co-op, so that's great. We're trying to get to 75 or even 100 by the end of March. Um, and so we'll really be able to, uh, to get a good deal. And in the next um, two or three weeks, we'll be sending out our bid to companies. And so, uh, so showing that we have a lot of folks uh, involved will help us to get good, uh, good pricing. You get support from Solar United Neighbors throughout the process. Uh, we are here to answer your questions. And if you have any issues with the company, we can help work through those. Uh, you know, we try to help folks connect with other people going solar in their area and create community around uh, going solar. Um, you know, that has become harder to do as socializing has become harder to do over the last year, but uh, we're trying different different ways to stay in touch virtually. And then just, you know, becoming a part of the, the growing solar movement, we do a lot of policy uh, and advocacy work as well. And so we'll be able to connect you uh, into that. This is essentially the, the process of how the co-op works and you know it, it can be a four to eight month process but that's kind of on on our time scale uh, once you sign up and and once the installer is selected it goes faster than that um, but step one is what you're doing now to learn about the co-op and uh, sort of learn more about solar in general and then you'll want to sign up if you're at all interested through the website which we'll put up at the end of the the presentation uh, it is free to sign up for the co-op and you're under no obligation to go solar if you uh, sign up for the co-op. So it's, it's really kind of no risk for you. Uh, we don't sell the names of people that sign up for the, the group kind of outside of the process. 
so we're just, you know, we're just here to help. Um, we then ask people to, to grow the co-op through the, um, through the process so that we can uh, build up the group. And once we have at least 30 members, so we're already at 45 for, for this group, but I think we'll continue to grow it a little more. Uh, but once we get to kind of critical mass, we'll issue a request for proposal to local installation companies. And so we have a bunch of installers that are already on our list. Uh, and if there are any installers on the call uh, now that you know, are not on our list and want this information, we can definitely send it to you. Uh, but essentially we give in the solar companies two weeks to bid on our group and say, hey, we've got 50 houses and we're expecting it to get even bigger than that. You know, what pricing can you offer this group? What warranties can you offer? Uh, you know, what are, uh, what's your experience in the region? What's your experience generally? What's your staffing situation? Are you able to do this in house? Are you gonna subcontract it? Uh, and then we call through references that the companies give us to kind of get sort of lay of the land and, you know, check, check, check licensing and just different things. And then ultimately it's up to you as the co-op to decide which company you want to pick. So we facilitate the process, uh, but it's really up to you. And so we facilitate what's called a selection meeting where co-op members can come together and review the bids and pick one company based on the bids that we get in. So that's essentially the, the process and we will do that part of it in uh, February. And then we have a deadline to sign up for the co-op. So that's the end of March. So all of your friends and neighbors can join the, the co-op through the end of March. And so hopefully it'll get a lot bigger than uh, it even is now. And then once the installer is chosen, we do give them the list of people that have signed up and then they will start to make calls and send emails to schedule a visit with you, uh, likely virtually first to uh, just talk through, you know, what, what your needs are, what their process is like. Uh, we'll send you information beforehand so you know what to expect on pricing and uh, things about the company. And then uh, they will give you a proposal based on the group pricing that, uh, that they sent us and that was selected by the, the committee. And then at that point, you can decide whether you want to sign a contract and go solar with that company or whether you wanna walk away and go with a different company or whether you figured out that solar just isn't for you at this point. So it's really all up to you. Um, and then when you sign a contract, uh, so, you know, the thing that's in it for us, if anything, throughout this process is that we do get a small fee from the uh, solar company for every contract that's signed. And so that's $600 that pays Solar United Neighbors to help facilitate the group and the whole uh, process. And we ask that they build that into the group discounted pricing. So you're not gonna see that as a line item uh, on your proposal. And then, uh, and then you'll get installed once the permits are pulled, once the utility has allowed for the interconnection uh, application to go through uh, and, and then turn it on. And then, you know, in the past we've tried to do parties and have people meet each other that are in the co-op. Uh, we've, we continue to try to do those virtually, but um, of course we're all adapting to the virtual uh, social distancing world that we live in. And so I uh, just wanted to mention this. So yes, we have moved all of our programming online. You can purchase and install solar with little or zero contact. Um, companies are meeting with people uh, virtually um, and can assess your home by not coming inside. Typically, they sometimes they want you to send uh, you, them a picture of, uh, of your electrical box. Um, and they'll assess your roof and see if, if you need to do anything with your roof beforehand. So, and then the installers have been allowed to operate kind of throughout the, the process. And we do ask uh, installers about their social distancing procedures. Many of them have uh, sort of blog posts or uh, a section of their website that's dedicated to their process at, at this point. So we wanna make sure everybody stays safe throughout this. So just to um, uh, conclude this section, 
and emphasize a few things. So co-op members are the people that you all are the folks that are going to pick the solar company, folks that are uh, decide to participate in the selection committee, and then um, and and you know when you sign up for the co-op, you can indicate what's important to you, and the committee will take that into account. So whether you're just looking for the lowest price, whether you want uh, a low price, but high quality equipment, you want a strong warranty that comes with your system, you want experience and some, somebody that's a, a local provider that's kind of bringing dollars back into the local community. Um, we've seen co-ops kind of make all kinds of different decisions. And so this is, uh, these are the things that most groups um, really think about. So let me stop there and Vincent, can I ask you if there's any um, questions that have been asked that would be appropriate to address now versus later? Uh, I think that uh, I've been able to answer all of them, but uh, there are some that I said that you would cover in the uh, next section about prices and stuff like that. Okay, perfect. So let's move on to that. So uh, talking about economics and prices, so this, you know, the cost of solar has really fallen uh, dramatically, uh, especially over the last 10 years. Uh, and then over the last, you know, six or so years has fallen and then leveled off a bit. Uh, this graph shows the average national price per watt, which is how solar is generally priced is by the watt. Uh, and so the blue dots are the national average, and then the yellow dots are the sun co-op price per watt average. So, um, you know, it depends on the group, it depends on the bids that we get in, but in general, uh, our bids for the base price come in 15 to 20% below uh, market. And that has tracked also with our co-ops in Arizona. And that's because the cost of solar is, is kind of broken down in this way at this point. So uh, historically it used to, the system components used to be more of the overall cost, but now there's more soft costs involved, which includes marketing to find customers. Uh, you know, the, all the folks that are knocking on your door or the annoying ads you see on Facebook or things like that, all of that costs a lot of money. And so then they have to build that into the overall, you know, pricing of the system, the cost it took to find you and get you to sign a contract. Um, we are bringing companies, a whole group of people that are educated, kind of ready to go, uh, have more confidence because they're going through the group process. And so, uh, so they can often translate uh, some of those soft cost savings onto co-op members in addition to the fact that they can, you know, order, you know, kind of parts in bulk and, and know that they have a lot of customers coming through the pipeline. There are some um, incentives that are available for solar that you may have heard about. And there have been some recent changes to the incentives that I want to make sure folks are aware of. So uh, first is the federal income tax credit for solar is uh, set to go down. However, it uh, was recently extended. So, uh, so it is currently 26% of the cost of the system, which includes labor and installation and everything that you pay the company, you can write 26% of the cost of that off of your uh, federal income taxes um, for 2021. And that is the same for next year in 2022 it goes down to 22% the, in 2023, and then it's gonna go away entirely unless it's extended by Congress again in 2024. So the next couple of years uh, would be uh, advantageous to go solar if you uh, pay federal income taxes, because uh, as you can see here, you know this is an example of a seven kilowatt system, which is kind of the average size of our Arizona co-op so far. And 275 a watt is is um, a little. It's kind of like the pricing you could get off the street today um, for solar in Arizona. So you know, saving 5,000 bucks on the cost of the system uh, is uh, is pretty good. 
So this is a sample pricing for APS customers and, uh, and also some savings projections. And so I'll walk through this and then I'm gonna talk through some APS specifics before we wrap up because I'm uh, assuming that most people are gonna have APS who kind of go through this process. So um, if, if, uh, if we take 275 a watt, which is $2.75 per watt, uh, which is like the average off the street price right now for solar. So our co-ops base price could be, uh, could be lower than that and, and tends to be lower than that. But just, just to be conservative, uh, we looked at a, a range here of a, a smaller four kilowatt system or a larger eight kilowatt system. And uh, there's a, we added the federal income tax credit in here as well as the state of Arizona has a state tax credit that's worth up to $1,000 that you can write off the cost of the system. So that's, that's an additional uh, bonus. So once you look at those uh, tax breaks, the net cost looks to be something like seven to $15,000 uh, depending. And if you're on the higher end, you know, it may cost a little bit more if you're closer to that 10 kilowatt mark. And then we've done some modeling based on the APS rates and based on uh, kind of different projections for, uh, you know, uh, large energy users, small energy users, large house, small house, all of that stuff, and tried to give a range, like a reasonable range for what folks could expect as far as what your payback is going to be for solar. And this is all going to, you know, depend on those things for yourself, uh, but. But in general, we found that you could probably pay, that your solar array would pay for itself in something like 10 to 12 years. And so for, uh, for buying the system, there's a few ways that folks uh, pay for solar these days. Uh, one is just to pay in cash up front if you have the cash to do that. And, uh, and that's something you're comfortable with. You can also take out a loan, um, just like buying a car. So uh, talking to your bank or shopping around with credit unions. There are many credit unions now that have solar specific loan products that you could look at and, and more institutions kind of understand financing this product now. Uh, some people refinance and take out cash through that process to pay for uh, solar. You could also look into taking out a home equity line of credit uh, and the interest on, on the home equity line of credit is tax deductible uh, because it's going towards a home improvement, which is the, the, the solar installation. And then some solar installers may offer their own financing options. Uh, many of them are kind of hooked up with different financial uh, providers that you know, kind of see solar as a, as a good way to make money for them. And then, you know, something that we just see that I want to caution is just to watch out for fees from, uh, from those companies. Often they will advertise a really low interest rate, but then there's a kind of a high, uh, high percentage fee to access the loan up front. And so just read the small print. And if anybody has questions, um, you know, definitely feel free to ask us. And then, you know, leasing is another way that solar um, had been working in Arizona, but what would probably caution people against doing a lease for a number of reasons. Um, one is that, you know, you are not able to get the tax incentives if you lease a system. The company is the one that takes those tax incentives. And so from some of the bids that I've seen uh, from a lot of the bigger companies that do leasing, it's just not, uh, the, the cost is just too high to kind of uh, pan out. Um, and it's, it's not typically a great option unless you just have no tax burden and are not able to um, access uh, loan financing. And, you know, there, there are also other issues like the long-term contracts are 20 to 25 years for loans and the, the monthly costs of those escalate over time. So you might not pay anything upfront, but you're locked into paying um, this company for 20 or 25 years at a rate that may escalate higher than the rate of, uh, of utility um, costs. And then it can make selling your home harder. So 
uh, we've heard from, you know, certain, and if anybody here is in the real estate business, uh, you know, taking on a, a solar lease in a house uh, can, can sometimes be something that a buyer does not want to do. So just a few thoughts there on financing. So um, let's spend a little time on APS and the solar rates that are offered to solar customer or the rates that are offered to solar customers uh, and just try to provide some basic info. You know, would really encourage folks to go to the APS website and look at this information yourself and for your own electricity use. And it's also something that the solar company should be uh, providing you in their projections. But when you go solar with APS, you're gonna get a choice of three different rate plans uh, to be on. And so I wanted to break those down for you as you're making this decision. So the first is just called saver choice. And this plan is, is a time of use plan, which means that energy is more expensive from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. So many folks may already be on a similar plan to this. Uh, APS has kind of been migrating people onto these newer plans over the last couple of years. Um, but essentially you wanna make sure to, to uh, offset or use less energy during those peak hours from three to eight. Uh, this plan has super off peak pricing in the winter. So energy is really cheap from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. And that's because people are just not using a lot of energy across their service territory and because they have a glut of uh, extra cheap solar energy during the day. And so prices are cheap at that point. This plan for solar uh, has a monthly grid access charge, which APS calculates based on your the size of your uh, solar array. There's no demand charges with this plan, which I'll get into in the next um, plans. Uh, and then all of these plans you have access to, uh, you'll earn monthly solar credits from APS for any extra solar that you send them. And then in talking to the, the company and just kind of anecdotally in our modeling, you know, this is the most popular plan with new APS solar customers um, because we, we find that most people can just benefit financially more uh, with this plan with uh, the way most, most folks use energy. The other two plans are more similar than they are different. So I'm gonna lump them together here. Uh, but these plans are, are called Saver Choice Plus and Saver Choice Max. And these are both time of use plans. So they have the differentiated, you know, uh, where energy is more expensive in the afternoon hours during the week, three to eight. Um, but these plans also come with demand charges. And so I'll talk about what that means. Uh, these plans have lower energy costs. So this, the basic saver choice plan is, is about 10 cents off peak and 24 cents on peak. These plans are uh, cheaper than that. They're more like, so one of them is like four to eight cents. And so you have low energy costs, but, but APS makes up for that by charging a demand fee. And so the, the demand charge is a monthly charge that's based on the one hour that you have the highest use during those three to 8 p.m. peak hours during the weekdays. Um, there's no super off peak hours that has sort of that really cheap energy. Uh, this one also has, does not have a grid access charge for solar customers, which is good. Um, but often, you know, we kind of see that the grid access charge would be less than what the demand charge would be. And then you still get monthly credits for solar, uh, extra solar from APS. Uh, and just because of, uh, of the way these plans are structured, these are less popular with, uh, with new APS solar customers. So this chart just kind of breaks down the differences. And again, this, this information is all on APS's website. So I would encourage you to look, uh, look at the details there. Um, but you know, the saver choice plan uh, the energy off peak is around 11 cents, energy on peak is around 24 cents. And so if you're offsetting that, that 24 cent energy in the, the late afternoon, that's really beneficial for, for you. Um, 
and on the plus and max plans, you know, the energy costs are, are pretty cheap, uh, but you have to pay these kind of um, these demand charges based on the amount of energy you're drawing during, during one hour. And all of them, you get this solar export credit, which is, uh, which is just right around 10 and a half cents for any extra solar that you're sending to uh, APS. So just to give a, a quick kind of real world example, because um, I think this is helpful for me <laughs> at least, but uh, you know, if you break down an APS bill, and I took this from one of our co-op members who shared uh, their bill, and this was a Phoenix customer, so the energy usage is gonna be different for, for Northern Arizona customers. Uh, and this was a, a September bill, so kind of a higher energy use month. But you know, I wanted to make sure not to paint a too rosy picture. Um, so this person used 175 kilowatt hours on peak, and so at that 24 cent rate, that's going to cost them $42.55 for this month. They used 525 kilowatt hours on peak or off peak, excuse me, which is what uh, just under 11 cents. And so $57 for the month. And then the, they have a seven kilowatt system. So uh, their grid access charge is 93 cents per kilowatt of solar installed. So this person's uh, grid access charge is $6.51 a month. And then there are monthly fixed charges, which are just what they are. And that's around $13 a month and taxes that are around $13 a month. And then this person basically uh, sold APS 450 kilowatt hours of, of their solar, extra solar through this month at the 10 and a half cent rate. And so they get a credit of $47. Uh, and so their total that they owed APS in, in the September bill was $85 and 11 cents. So again, that hopefully that provides just sort of uh, a real world example of how one of these rate plan works. This is just the saver choice plan. So the time of use plan. And, and it was also a house in Phoenix. So it probably uses more energy than um, many of your homes. So how to save with solar under the current plans. It's, you know, it's possible to, to do so and to use solar to cut your bill if you can play kind of by the rules. So one is just line up energy use with the solar production times and hours. So when, when your solar is producing and you can offset as much energy as you can, uh, if you limit your energy use during those peak hours, you can save, uh, uh, you can save money that way. If you do choose to be on a demand rate, um, it, you really need to limit and stagger your appliance uses during the peak hours. So not stacking, uh, you know, not doing the laundry, not doing the dish, like running the dishwasher, um, all of that stuff will, will uh, really add up and, and, and hit you with a big demand charge. So avoid doing that. And then, you know, just still kind of conserve energy overall. So don't assume that because you went solar, you can just start to, to um, use lots of energy. Any extra solar or any extra energy that you do not need is going to get credited by APS. And so uh, that can help you save on your bill every month. And then, you know, I think smart thermostats really can help and are a, are a cost effective way to manage the different peak hours. Um, you know, my thermostat at home, I can set to four different times. And so I can really adjust around the, uh, uh, the, the rate structures there. And there are rebates available for many smart thermostats. So uh, I'm gonna wrap up and then we can answer any questions that are remaining. Really appreciate everybody's time this, this evening. Um, so this is the co-op website. So if you haven't signed up yet and you're interested, you know, go to the website. Uh, it's solarunitedneighbors.org slash N-A-Z. So hopefully really easy to remember. Uh, and then just hit that orange join the co-op button and put in some of your basic info and then you'll be a member of the co-op and it's free to join and you know no pressure 
So uh, you'll get on our email list as well and hopefully want to stay on our email list. And we are you know, working to maintain and improve solar policy in Arizona and, uh, and you know, nationally. So uh, we'll send you opportunities to get involved that way. We're trying to get to uh, get the 100% clean energy rules passed at the uh, Arizona Corporation Commission right now. And if anybody wants to talk more about that, happy to do so. And then, uh, of course, just go to our website where we've got a lot of information. So solarunitedneighbors.org slash Arizona. And thank you so much. And thank you to, to DC and, and City of Flagstaff uh, for working with us, as well as City of Sedona and Coconino County. We're really excited to be working in Northern Arizona. And you know we already have 45 members of this co-op. And so I think uh, we've got a lot more room to grow and we're excited to, um, to, to be doing it. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions that we should answer. And Vincent, can you help facilitate? Um, I, was, I was busy answering questions the entire time, uh, but I, I didn't hear if you covered the HOA question. Oh yeah. So, uh, and can you just read the question? Uh, basically the ask. Yeah, basically it asked uh, what, if anything, can HOAs do to prevent someone from going solar? Yeah, good, great question. So there is a law in Arizona that says that HOAs cannot outright uh, ban or stop you from going solar. Uh, that law has been upheld by the Arizona Supreme Court uh, years ago in a decision. So HOAs are allowed to uh, sort of put forth in the statute, it's, you know, um, reasonable rules and regulations, and some of them go further than others. Uh, so, you know, I'd say watch out for really high HOA, um, you know, fees on design review, or, you know, if they're being really stingy about, you know, which place, you know, if they can be visible from the street or something like that, it, if, if they're really outright stopping you from 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 doing it you may have a case uh to uh to push back and we can help you to to push back uh as well if you if anybody has trouble but there's um there there is a state law and there's precedent in the courts for um upholding it um, another question do solar panels increase the cost of your homeowner's insurance Great question. So uh, we advise everyone that goes solar to contact their homeowner's insurance uh, company and let them know that you're, you're going solar. Uh, we find that it should, uh, it tends not to go up uh, and in some cases may go down because solar uh, actually protects areas of your roof. Uh, so solar panels are built to withstand hail like we had today where I live uh, and other things. And so, uh, but different companies see it differently. So if, if your policy does increase, you should ask why and you may wanna shop around. But we do advise that you uh, contact the company. Um, another question, how well do modern panels hold up to hail? Um, that's a great question, one that a lot of people do ask. Um, they are tested for hail up to a certain size and up to a certain uh, like speed falling from the sky. Uh, Brett, if you have any more information about that, I would just generally say um, if you do have a, a hailstorm that would destroy your roof, then likely you'll have, um, you know, hail damage to the to the panels as well. Do you, and do you know, Vincent, if that's um, something that's covered in in the manufacturer's warranty, it's hail hail damage, or is it only guaranteed up to a certain uh, size? That's a great question, and I would need to do more research. Okay, well, maybe um, we can look into that. Another question. Uh, I'm an existing solar electric system homeowner in Flagstaff, um, attending to compare info and along with friends. Okay, glad, glad you're here, Karen. Uh, Sun's info is valid. Their estimated costs are less than what we paid about six years ago. We have a 
six uh, kilowatt system and sell electricity back to APS most months. So I guess this is a comment. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, the prices have gone down in six years. Um, they, uh, and, and that's because the industry has grown uh, and, and prices should uh, continue uh, to go down as, as long as the demand is high. Yeah, and th thanks for being here. And, and um, if, if they're still on, you know, definitely talking to your friends and neighbors about going solar once you've done it is, is one of the, the, the big ways that people end up uh, pulling the trigger. Vincent, any other questions? Nope. Okay. Well, thanks everybody so much for your time this evening. Uh, we cranked through a lot in an hour. Uh, you know, check out the co-op website if you'd like to sign up. Uh, thank you again, DC and City of Flagstaff, and we will be in touch, but have a great week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brett.